We're turning this evening to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 17, where we read, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And the whole verse continues, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Well, tonight I want to think about the subject of the felt presence of Christ. The Lord, he says, stood with me and strengthened me. And of course, believers do long to know the presence of our Saviour. He is our best friend. He is the one who we adore and worship. It's said that he is a poor man who has no friends. But the Christian, you see, is somebody who has a friend beyond the, all, uh, beyond all others, the best friend of all. Uh, and that, of course, is Christ himself. What a remarkable thing it is, isn't it, that God in his common grace has given us friends in this world. It's a disappointing world in many ways. It's so dark and difficult to live in this world. It can be a very lonely place. And yet it is wonderful how the Lord can give us friends here on earth. And if we have a true friend, then we, we know that they often can halve our troubles and double our joys as we talk to them, uh, how encouraging they can be. But on the other hand, we know what it's like, perhaps, to have fair weather friends. We have the swallows arriving soon and... Uh, we know that they're only here for, for the best season of the year. They're fair weather friends. And perhaps many of us have known what it's like to have friends like that, one-sided friends. But here we see how the Lord was Paul's best friend. He stood by him in, at a time of great darkness and trouble. And how few there are that will do that, who will stand by us in times of sickness, in times of disappointment, in times when we are in need. Well, the Apostle Paul here in this chapter is, of course, in the final days of his earthly pilgrimage. And he himself had a few very precious friends. And one of them, of course, was Timothy himself, his beloved son in the faith. And we can see here that at this time, he longed for Timothy to come. In verse 9, he says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. He longed for Mark, in verse 11, to come. Bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. But then in verse 13, he says, bring the parchments, bring the cloak that I left with you. But then he goes on in verse 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter. He longed to see Timothy in these final days of his earthly journey here. But then I want us to think more specifically if Christ is our best friend here upon earth, then let us ask this question. How can we as believers know the presence of Christ? It's the most important question. Maybe there have been times in your life where you have said that you have felt the Lord's presence in some particular situation. And perhaps you're not quite sure what you really mean in one sense. You couldn't put it into words to other people, but you know the reality of it. 
in your own heart. And yes, we do sometimes say that we felt that the Lord was there this evening. After a service, perhaps, or some other meeting, then we felt the presence of the Lord in the midst. Of course, Christ promised, didn't he? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But individual believers can also know something of the felt presence of Christ. Now, we may say, and people may dismiss it as mere emotion, just our feelings. But how do we, from a biblical point of view, understand what is meant when we say, like Paul here, that the Lord was with me and strengthened me? Well, the first question is, who was present with Paul here in this, on this occasion? He says, the Lord. And undoubtedly, he's referring back to verse 1, where he speaks of the Lord, the same word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, of course, Scripture teaches us that God is a triune God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everything from the Father, uh, everything springs from the Father and comes to us through the Son. And then the Holy Spirit takes those things, those precious things, and applies them to our hearts. All three persons of the Godhead are involved when the Lord does anything. The Father is the cause, the Son is the mediator, and the Spirit applies and accomplishes what the Lord purpose, what the Father and the Son purpose. And so this is always how God works. He is God, three in one and one in three. Uh, the Apostle John, in his gospel, he says, though God is invisible, he said in John 1, no man has seen him at any time, but he has been revealed unto us through his Son, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, to see the Son is to see the Father. You remember that famous occasion in John 14 where Philip said, show us the Father and and it will suffice us, it will be enough. If only we could see the Father, then we would believe that Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Believest thou this? And so to see the Son is to see the Father. And to come to the Father, we must come through the Son. And to know the Son is to know the Father. And if the Spirit comes to us, then it is the Son who has come to us. We can read of that in John 16. And when the Son speaks, it is by the Spirit. If you turn to Revelation 2, I know I'm probably uh, going through lots of uh, doctrinal things here, but it's important for us to grasp in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, we read, uh, hear that unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. In his majesty, he walks in the midst of the golden candlesticks, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord, uh, that he speaks to the church. And in verse 10 of chapter 1, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. When the Son speaks then, it is the Spirit that brings his message. And uh, the Son speaks by the Spirit. So we cannot divide the Trinity. God is still God. And so when we say that the Lord 
was there or the Lord was with me, of course, we mean the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when God's presence is known, it is the whole Godhead that is present there. Now, of course, God is present everywhere. And in that sense, he, you might say, isn't really particularly present in any one place. And yet, the Word of God teaches us that uh, in a number of places, we'll look at some in a moment, that there are special visits of the Lord to different people in Scripture. But Job reminds us that God is everywhere. He sees everything we're doing. He said in Job 23, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. The Lord knows, doesn't he, all of our trials, all of our problems. Why? Because not only is, is he omniscient, all-knowing, he is all-present. He is everywhere. And yet, in Scripture, we find, secondly then, these special visits of the Lord. In the Old Testament, we have what we call the Theophanies, those special pre-incarnate appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before he came to Bethlehem, he came to this world and visited his people at special times. One of them, and some may debate this, I really firmly believe is in Genesis 3 verse 8, when Adam and Eve, you remember, had fallen into sin and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden at the cool of the day. That was a very special presence of God, a notable presence of the Lord. They knew it was the Lord there. He was really present with them in the garden. And interestingly there, it says the voice of the Lord was heard walking. It's almost like the voice itself is personified. And of course, Christ in the New Testament is called the Word of God. He speaks what the Father tells him to say. And so we have in Genesis 18, you remember another occasion where the three visitors came to Abraham. They visited him to confirm the promise to him concerning a son. You remember how Sarah laughed? Nothing with God would be called impossible. And yet one of those three visitors, we discover, was God himself. And two of the others were angels going off towards Sodom. And God remained behind. And so he was present in a very special way. Then, of course, we can think of Jacob. Who was it that he wrestled with? But none other than the Lord himself. Moses at the burning bush. Samuel hearing his voice. Sensing the presence of the Lord even in his bedroom. And then Isaiah, he saw the Lord, Jehovah, and he fell down at his presence. He was overcome by the holiness of the Lord, overwhelmed by the presence of God. But then, of course, Christ himself, the eternal Son of God, became man there at Bethlehem, born of a virgin. He visited his people, it says. And he came in that remarkable way, 
to be present in the midst of his beloved people and to minister to them, the God-man. And then, of course, he traveled around. He went to Nazareth, of course. He went to Bethlehem, to Galilee, all around Judea, to Jerusalem. Now, after his crucifixion and resurrection, his presence was made known again at the tomb. You remember that wonderful resurrection morning, the joy that the women knew. Uh, Mary in particular, she saw the Lord. Then, of course, Thomas. He sensed the presence of Christ, didn't he? Down in the upper room with the other disciples. And he said, my Lord and my God. Then there were the two on the road to Emmaus. And we often think of them at Easter time and how wonderful it is to hear what they uh, communed with one another to some degree and what they said. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? Christ was in our presence. And we knew it not. And so he was really and specially present with them. And then, of course, after the ascension, the church felt the presence of Christ on occasions in some dramatic ways. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and there were tongues of fire seen, and there was the rushing mighty wind heard and felt. And what did it do but embolden them? to preach in the name of Christ. Well, there are many other ways we can look at this. We can think of how the presence of the Lord was confirmed by miracles as Paul and others went to preach the gospel. We think of Paul at Cyprus before Sergius Paulus, uh, the governor there in Paphos, and there was Elymas, and Paul struck him blind. And that was a sign of the presence of the Lord and a divine presence accompanying that message. Now, of course, of course Christ was also seen again after the, after, the res after the ascension, both physically and in visions. And we can think uh, of how Stephen, when he was stoned, there he was, suffering, but yet his face did not show any sign of it. His face was as an angel of God because he could see the Lord. He looked up and he beheld Christ. And he said, I see Jesus sitting, standing rather, at the right hand of the majesty on high. So we can think of this, the presence of Christ on these occasions. And then uh, we notice in the life of Paul in particular, he heard and saw Christ on the road to Damascus. It was a very real presence. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? But then a number of times through his life, there were particular moments of the Lord's presence. We can think of one occasion that he speaks of in Acts 18, a time of great discouragement in Corinth. It seemed like everyone was hostile against him and against the message. And then he heard in a night vision how the Lord spoke to him so wonderfully. We can read it here in Acts chapter 18. Uh, and if you turn to verse 9, it's good for us to remind ourselves of these occasions from time to time. And in verse 9, he says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, 
and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And then if you turn on to Acts chapter 23 and verse 11, again, we see how he had given his defense before the Jewish council. And there in verse 11, he says, And the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Be of good cheer. And so the Lord appeared to him in these remarkable and special ways. But then, of course, John uh, was exiled, uh, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, and uh, he saw a vision of the Lord, not the physical presence of Christ, but he had that great vision, and Christ was uh, known to him through the vision. This, then, is the testimony of Scripture, these special visits of the Lord. But what about us? How does this wonderful teaching that we discover in Scripture apply to us? So thirdly tonight, should we expect the Lord to visit us? And how? Well, of course, it won't be through a theophany. It won't uh, be the actual presence of Christ physically, like he walked around Galilee and did his miracles. We don't expect such a visitation from the Lord. Why? Because scripture is our uh, witness of the wonderful works of Christ. We don't have need now of the physical presence of Christ in the same way because the word of God is given to us. And we read uh, how the apostle himself, Paul, was the last to see uh, the Lord. He says, last of all, in 1 Corinthians 15, he was seen of me also. No one has seen him since. And so believers should not expect any physical or even visionary sight of the Lord. And what then is the experience of the Lord that we as ordinary, if we can use that term, Christians, what should we expect? Well, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, he says this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Faith was the essential thing. And he says, whom having not seen, ye love. There's the key, isn't it? To understanding what we should expect. We have not seen Christ, but we love him. And he goes on and he says, uh, Yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. So in other words, we can read between the lines here and we can say, what is a believer missing if he doesn't actually see the Lord? Whether it's in a physical way or in a visionary way, and the answer is nothing. He's not missing anything. Because the New Testament speaks of the importance of faith. You remember Christ said, blessed to Thomas, blessed are they whom having not seen, believe. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we look not at the things which are seen, 
but the things which are not seen. You might say, well, how can you look at something that's not seen? Well, of course, it's with the eye of faith. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So if our treasure is in heaven, our physical senses in this body of flesh They cannot reach, cannot feel, uh, or we we won't rather feel those, those spiritual things in a physical way. They can only be spiritually discerned. They cannot be handled or touched or smelt. And so it is by faith. We have that promise. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I. In the midst, we perceive the presence of Christ by faith. And it is just as real. The heavenly treasures of that eternal life that Christ has secured for his people are certain and sure. Nothing can take away uh, those precious things from God's people. The promise is sure. God will keep his covenant promised to his people. But they are spiritual blessings and not physical. And yet Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So how then, lastly tonight, Uh, how then is Christ's presence usually felt? And what did Paul feel here when he says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me? Well, the right answer, of course, is that it wasn't a sensation. It's nothing sensational to feel the presence of Christ. It's not some kind of phenomena, but it is within, within our heart. We can feel and know the presence of Christ. Now, of course, only Christians can feel the presence of Christ and know Christ. If you're speaking of an unbeliever, an unconverted person, well, the gospel to them is is not real. They they don't know the precious things of God. And so, until we're born again, until we're given that new new heart, it's only then can we, we know the presence of Christ in a special way. And... It's because believers are born again and awakened to life. They have the work of the Holy Spirit going on in their heart. The Holy Spirit has caused them to be born again, to be given that spiritual life. They're now alive unto God and their hearts are a spiritual temple, a place of worship and adoration for him. There is an altar within their heart of love to the Saviour. And we love to hear of Christ. We love to hear of our Saviour. Now, how do we feel the presence of Christ? Sometimes it's in the preaching. When Christ is being exalted, then our hearts are drawn out in love to him because we already love him, but we adore him, and we are reminded of his great work for us in the ministry. And sometimes we get to the end of the service and we say to ourselves, the Lord was there tonight. I felt the Lord speaking to me. My heart leapt at the thought that he was near at hand this evening is something very real and something very precious. And then, of course, we can know the presence of the Lord 
in providential things. Eliezer, Abraham's servant who went to find a wife for Isaac, Rebekah. He said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. The Lord had done wonderful things. He almost stood back in absolute awe and amazement at what the Lord could do. And all he could say was to worship and say, I was just in the way. But the Lord was here, working all things for good. And so it's not through signs or wonders or supernatural phenomena, but it's by the Spirit. It's in the heart. These are spiritual things which have to be spiritually discerned. And of course, yet it's so real, so precious, and so wonderful to feel and know the presence of Christ. Well, what did Paul feel in conclusion tonight? Well, really, this chapter is a chapter of two halves. On the one half, we have Paul's painful things that he lists out. In verse 10, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He's gone to Thessalonica. Demas, who was my fellow worker, has left me. He was no true friend of the apostle. But then he says about Alexander the coppersmith in verse 14, he did me much evil. Beware of him. He's dangerous to believers. Paul's heart then was torn. And there, of course, was the great pressure and it was a, an enormous strain probably building in his heart knowing that soon he must give a defense before the emperor. He was in prison awaiting his trial and then he was called up for his first defense. And you can read here of how he says in verse uh, 16, at my first answer, this is his first defense, it had just taken place. And this defense that he gave before Nero, he must have done it in the courtroom amongst hostile pagan crowds and Gentile crowds. And he says there was nothing in that courtroom, nothing about the environment, about the people there that was in any way positive for Paul. And there's something also very moving and touching in verse 16 because he says, no man stood with me. Even believers who loved the Savior deserted the apostle at his hour of need. And he said, the Lord, I pray God, rather, that it may not be laid to their charge. He was alone before the emperor. And as he began his court, as he began his defense before that assembly with his heart full of sorrow and saw, no doubt, at all those that had deserted him, he began to preach Christ. And as he did so, something remarkable happened to the apostle because he sensed the presence of his Lord with him there. Of course, Paul confessed that his speech was not eloquent, but you notice what he says here, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known 
and that all the Gentiles might hear. There was something about that sermon which caught those people spellbound. And Paul's trial was deferred and he was let go for a season. And Christ was preached and the gospel was proclaimed. He says that all, but so by me, he says, the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. That's Nero himself. But the Lord was there. He stood with me. And you notice he says he strengthened me in my hour of need. <clears throat> and the Lord can make himself known to us through prayer and through preaching. When we are serving him, when we are alone, when we are in temptation, when we are under persecution, in all circumstances. And this is what the apostle says in verse 18. The Lord shall deliver me, and with this we close, from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory for ever and ever. <clears throat>